Greetings, and welcome to my channel. This is Sorcerer Tal. You can also find me on Facebook in the Sorcerer's Guild. Today on Sorcerer's Shadow Volume 2 and Magical Theory, we are going to be having a discussion on war water and quantum entanglement. Now, this is my second video with that title, and the first video was used as the rough draft for the essay in this video. So we have covered this quite thoroughly. I will leave a link to the first video here. And as I say in that first video, I am... I do not have a PhD in physics. I am only a layman when it comes to quantum physics. I have had discussions with people that do have PhDs in this field, so I do feel that I have some grasp on the concept, but essentially I am speaking from a pseudoscience perspective when it comes from quantum entanglement. But from the way that I understand quantum entanglement, the way that one particle affects, the way that when two particles become entangled, when two molecules are connected, when they are taken apart, what affects one molecule affects the other. Now, in because I don't have a uh, large uh, authority on physics, we're going to keep that very simple. That is the basic idea. When two particles become entangled, when you, or molecules, become entangled, if you remove them, what you do to one affects the other. And so this holds true not only for the molecules that they experiment with in the lab, but also the molecules of your hair, fingernails, things of that nature. So that's where the quantum entanglement gets involved. But in this particular video, we are going, since we've covered that thoroughly, we're going to stick more to the how-tos in this video, how to make war water, and some of the things on which it can be used for. Okay, so how do we make war water? Well, first of all, you don't need to have a target in mind yet when you make war water. Traditionally, you would take 13 iron nails and put them in water and leave it out from one full moon until the next. And then you get that rusty water, that iron suspended in water. And essentially, this is synthetic blood. Now, theoretically, one could enhance this by adding bits of magnesium and copper and the different things that make up blood itself to get it as much like blood as possible. And it's a good idea to go with this traditional method of keeping it out with the 13 nails from sunrise to sunset. Um, another traditional method though is to use iron spikes from a railroad. And that is actually what I typically use. 30 days is great. So from a full moon to a full moon leaving it out under the full moon to get that extra uh, momentum behind it of the repetition of that cycle, that all is very helpful. That being said, in an emergency, you can just file rust into water until you have the consistency, consistency that you were looking for, and it does seem to work. It probably doesn't work quite as good, but the important part here is creating that rusty water. Just like, you know, with a poppet. The longer you work on the poppet, the, the, the more you effort you put into it, the more thought goes into the creation of the poppet, the greater the link's going to be. The same with the war water. The more effort you put into creating it, the more work you put into it. The stronger the war water is going to be, as long as you don't do anything that is going to throw off that vibe. Because again, we are working more closely to the material plane here. So you don't want to throw in anything that's not going to be in, in blood into the war water. So you want to stick to the magnesium, copper, little bits of things that would actually, trace amounts of things that would actually be in blood into the water to make the war water. Now, once you have the war water, you don't actually have to have it have a particular target in mind. The war water itself can be used for several things. If you pour war water on all four corners of your property, this will help protect your property. 
You can also use it for anointing. Um, well, you can use it for anointing weapons. If you're anointing any iron or steel weapons, after you've anointed it with the war water, I wouldn't leave it on very long because I feel like that would make it rust. That concerns me. But that is a traditional idea of uh, anointing your uh, your knives and swords in war water. I have used it to anoint servitors, especially ones that I am about to send out to do something of a warlike nature. I will often anoint, well, not often, but I have before, anointed them with war water to give them an extra oomph for the, for the purpose that they are going for. Any time that you are doing war work that involves blood, you can anoint the tools and the candles with the war water before you begin the working, and this will help. Adding that extra oomph and getting that power out there. It's as if you are shedding blood for this working. Um, another pow very powerful tool that can be used here is to create a circle with war water when you are doing any of these types of workings to keep yourself safe. War water is not just an offensive tool. Yeah? Um, it can be an offensive tool. We'll get to some more of that in just a moment. But it is also a protective tool. Like I said, you can put it on the four corners of your house when you are doing a working, especially a working where you are just protecting, casting a protective circle around yourself before you do your own offensive working. War water is great for that kind of work. Of course, you're going to need enough to make a circle and you're going to need somewhere where it's not just going to... Well, I suppose if it dries up, it really doesn't matter. You just need to make the circle and then you have that protection from the war water, as if you would shed blood to make that area safe. Now, you can pour this war water onto someone else's doorstep. Don't get caught doing this because you might get in trouble, but that is the opposite. When you pour war water on someone else's property with the intent of causing them harm, that is what is going to happen. It is if you have shed blood to create that harm. Yeah? And that will, well, every time that a cycle, that every time a pattern is repeated, the momentum of its cycle increases. And uh, blood being shed on a person's property to cause them harm. Well, there's a lot of uh, pattern and cycle there. And this will feed into that and bring that momentum and energy onto the property. So, it's, like I said, as it, it is as if you shed blood to cause them harm. But you can do the same thing simply with the intent of protecting that person and it'll change the whole thing. And now you have shed blood to protect that person and you are protecting that home. You can use war water to anoint yourself anytime, well, if you were a, a soldier or someone of that nature who was in war, you can use the war water to anoint yourself. You can anoint it on your third eye so that you will be more clear. You will be more clear-sighted in battle and help your intuition of where the battle is going. You can anoint it onto your heart chakra to increase your bravery and courage, etc. Well, actually, I can't think of where, what other chakras you might want to use for that. It for war type stuff. I suppose you could use your crown chakra to keep yourself totally objective, or you could bathe your entire body in war water before you went to war, wash it off afterwards. I don't think that much iron on your skin is a good idea. So if you do, if you are some, a soldier or someone who is in a combat situation, you decide to wash your entire body in war water, like I said, I would suggest washing the actual war water off afterwards. It isn't necessary for the iron filaments to still be in your skin. It is, even though we are working closer to the material plane here, it is the symbolism that we are creating here when we are anointing things with the war water. Okay, so, now, um, now as I said in the video, uh, harming people or war-like applications is not the only thing that war water is good for. War water can be used to very directly affect the blood. 
In order to do that, of course, you need to add that quantum entanglement. You need to get the other person's fingernail clippings, hair. You could actually create war water for yourself even and use it to do medicinal workings on yourself or whatever type of working that you wanted to do on yourself. I can't imagine why one would want to uh, do anything besides medicinal workings on, on yourself, but you can use the war water to affect anyone's blood that their body has been well, quantumly entangled into the blood by in, into the war water by adding their DNA into it. This can be done with fingernail clippings, this can be done with hair, anything of that nature. Um, pictures have some effect, but you really want that actual DNA sample. Now, if you um, if this is someone you're trying to help, I wouldn't suggest using an actual like old school picture. There's a lot of toxic chemicals in there, and this can be very literal. So if you have the fingernail clippings and that type of stuff, leave the picture out. Especially if you are trying to do some kind of medicinal work with this person, adding herbs, that sort of thing, or simply making some more water of them and blessing it while it's in a silver bowl because the silver has some antimicrobial properties and it's also just conducive to that sort of working. And then it gives you a target inside the bowl to work on to do your healing energy and your energy workings through. Um, anything you add to the blood, to the war water, it will affect the person in a way as almost as if it was in their blood. As I say in the other video, I've seen people add alcohol to war water that has been connected to somebody and it does make them behave drunkenly. I have also seen people add coffee and make the person start getting agitated. So this is a very literal thing. This is something that you need to be careful with and mindful of. Yeah? This isn't the type of working that one does willy-nilly and not mindful of the results of what can occur when you do these types of workings. Because this can be used both ways. Like I said, anything you add to that war water, the person's body will begin to react as if it was affecting them. And this war water can also be used in spell bottles. This is, in fact, that's a great way to do this sort of thing. Rather than just putting a little bit in a chalice and adding what you want and casting at it like I had discussed earlier, the more traditional way is actually to use these in spell bottles instead of your own urine. You don't use both together because if you use your urine to power the spell bottle, that will cause a DNA link with the war water and whatever you do in that bottle is going to affect you as well as the person you were casting on. So remember that. It's one or the other or something else. Okay, if you're using war water in the bottle, you can use the war water that's connected to the person. You put the sample into the bottle, the DNA sample, hair, hair, fingernail clippings, that sort of thing, and then you add the war water up to a certain level, and then you add whatever things you are going to add to the bottle. And like I said, if this is some, something where you're healing the person, you would add medicinal herbs, maybe literal medicine, antibiotics, painkillers, anything like that. You would add that to the bottle, get it closer to the top, top it off, and then you can use that as the target sample to do the energy workings like I was discussing earlier. And the opposite if you are trying to harm that person. Okay, so let's see. I think we've covered quite a few of the uses. Um, railroad spikes have quite a few uses themselves in protection rituals. That's another thing that you can use. The four corners of your house is very significant in a lot of different protection spells. You can actually put uh, a railroad spike at each one of the four corners to hold down the foundation of your house, and that creates a protection there and creates an astral anchor point, which, well, it's kind of the way of giving, it's kind of a way of giving your house a stronger presence and making it harder for evil things to enter. You can also put uh, railroad spikes by the front door for a very similar purpose. Most of the times I've seen this done, it is one on each side, but you could put one on the inside of the door as well, just on the out, 
on the inside of where the door opens so it's not in the way. And that's often, that has been done. I've read about that. But the times I've seen it done, it was two railroad spikes on the outside of the doorway. Anyways, I think that's going to be it for this episode. Thank you once again for joining us. Oh, I almost forgot to say, um, if you would like to read along in the essay, there will be a link to a Google Dink. There will be a link to a Google Docs copy of this essay in the uh, description portion of the post, as long with as along with a link to where you can purchase a copy of the Sorcerer's Shadow Volume Two, should you so choose. Okay, a um, little bit of personal update. Uh, as you can see, I do still have the old background today, so I haven't left yet. Um, but by the time I do the next episode, I should be on the road. I plan on leaving sometime tomorrow. Probably by the time this episode is actually airing, I'll probably be on the road already. Anyways, thank you once again for joining us. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please take the opportunity to do so now. Until next time, bright blessings and an interesting fate. This has been Sorcerer Tal.